Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Pavel Tomancek uh, as a keynote speaker. Uh, Pavel is uh, originally from the Czech Republic. He got his uh, PhD with Anna Frusi at the EMBL, uh, working on kind of the genetics of uh, polarity determination, uh, and then went to Jerry Rubin's lab at UC Berkeley uh, as a postdoc, where uh, as a postdoc, as I understand it, that's where he really started to get interested in modeling. And he used some of the freedom that you have as a postdoc to kind of follow your own uh, nose to actually um, uh, start doing some uh, modeling and taking uh, and, and educating himself more about the modeling and uh, got really into image analysis uh, as well. And so now uh, as a group leader at the Max Planck Institute, uh, he really is focused on uh, kind of uh, uh, detailed image analysis and uh, mathematical modeling of develop developing systems. He's also a great um, believer in the power of evolution and the um, power of evolution to tell us a lot about mechanisms of development. Um, and in a, uh, he does this in a very, I think, very exciting way, combining mathematics, modeling, uh, and evolutionary uh, biology. Uh, he is also a passionate swimmer, I know, uh, from having been to meetings with him. The first thing he does is figure out where the closest pool is or a river or lake to swim in. Um, and uh, also, if you can find there's a, he's also been involved with the Fiji uh, development project. This is the uh, uh, Fiji is just image J for those of you who know about it. Uh, it's the um, Java based uh, open source imaging uh, uh, image analysis software. He's been a big player in the development of that. Uh, and if you can find it online, there's a great movie of one of the developers meetings where he goes into kind of full blown um, uh, hype man mode in front of the audience uh, yelling developers, developers, developers. It's really a, a remarkable performance, I have to say. So uh, I'll turn it over to Pavel now. Great, thank you very much. I will first fumble with the sharing the screen. Okay. Okay, and now... Um, wait a second. I just want to make sure that I'm showing the right presentation. Okay, yes. All right, good. So, um, well, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity to, to speak here and to present to you. Um, I, um, yeah, I would actually, I must say, I would, in fact, much rather be in the, at uh, Cold Spring Harbor now and uh, you know, after the talk, go down to the bar and watch a hockey game at the bar because that's uh, you know one of the great things about about Cold Spring Harbor that there is always a play of hockey um, on on TV. And I'm a huge hockey fan, and I find it actually surprising that it's not basketball; it's hockey. So it's amazing. Anyway, unfortunately, we cannot do that. So so this will be a talk about um, evolution of uh, morphogenesis and um, you know, the big uh, player here is going to be the, the flower beater, beetle, the tribolium castaneum, but I will try to somehow, you know, give a little bit more of a bigger picture. I mean, it's really a, an honor to speak at Cold Spring Harbor and have 45 minutes because usually you have something like 10. So thank you very much. This is fantastic. I can take it easy. And uh, please tweet away about this because, you know, the bad news is that most of this stuff is published, so it's kind of, you know, absolutely tweetable. So, so please tweet if you want. Okay, so I would say that, uh, you know, it's uh, known to all of us that, that uh, all uh, multicellular life is absolutely amazing in its ability to make shapes. I demonstrated here on these uh, three beautiful videos for animals, for fungi, and, and, and for plants. And so, you know, some of the, one of the questions which, of course, uh, fascinates us is, you know, uh, how does does life uh, actually create such uh, such shapes? And then we, of course, know that 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 it's uh, by making cells, the units of li life, act in concert to generate these these shapes, and we call this process a mor morphogenesis. And of course, animals are really the 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 the, the living beings which really excel. At creating uh, shapes, I will demonstrate this here on a crustacean, a shrimp, which um, has this remarkable property that on each of its body segments, it has an appendage 
which has a specialized function. Some is used for feeding, some for swimming. And that function is related to a specialized shape or, or form. And so how does, where does this diversity of shape and form actually arise? It arises through the process of development and we now have technology to look at it. So what you will be seeing here is a movie which is sped up 10,800 times, a movie which we did together with Stasos Pavlopoulos, where every cell of this crustacean uh, embryo is labeled, every, ev every nucleus and with light sheet microscopy for this animal, which is quite transparent, we can see essentially all, all of them. So we play, play this movie and then I will start to zoom in. This will probably not be completely smooth. At some point, we start seeing this little uh, pri primordia of appendages and we see the spectacle of morphogenesis unfold in front of our eyes. And we can see how cells are dividing in certain direction, moving past each other and creating this shape in front of our, our, our eyes. So this is something which is really fascinating and, 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 and I and of course many other, many of us try to understanding. So, so understand this. So how did life acquire this amazing ability to create shape? Of course, the answer is through the process of evolution. And I think, you know, we, we, we know um, actually a lot about, um, we know a lot about how um, multicellular life actually arose from unicellular, unicellular life, because it happens many, many times, we have a quite clear idea that that's what happened really a long, a long time, time ago. And many of us study morphogenetic processes and this concerted effort has uncovered a really plethora of morphogenetic me mechanisms which are capable of creating shape and form. However, I would argue that we do not really know that much. How, how did this um, diversity of mechanisms to create shape actually evolve through 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 evolution, and I think we can we can absolutely say that we understand the animal phylogeny based on the sequence of of genomes. This is something we absolutely know and uh, un understand. However, what we do not really understand is the phylogeny of more morph morphogenesis. And so if we accept that morphogenesis is nothing else than coordination of cell behavior to create shape, we argue that we really do not know and we need to know how many ways there are for cells to change their behaviors. We also need to know how many ways there are for cells to coordinate their, beha their behaviors to create shapes. And we have very little actually knowledge about when and how many times these mechanisms have have, have, have evolved. And so I would like to argue in, in this talk and, and in general that in order to understand about cellular life, its origin and current uh, di diversity, we need not only to understand how genes, uh, how, how genes and genomes uh, change and evolve, but we need to also understand how cells change shape and how they uh, behave collectively and to understand the, the, the relationship between these uh, two realms of, of, of biology. Okay, so, so you know, what, what processes can we, uh, can we pick to study this? I think you know, we can study any process as, as long as we can uh, compare it between species. And I would like to argue here that uh, actually a good process to pick is in fact gastroation, which is the you know, very initial morphogenetic pro process during individual development of most animals or every animal. It's good to, to, to look at it because, because it's common to all animals and therefore it is old and ancient. So it informs us, it tells us something about, uh, about uh, evolution. It is a process which is very simple and accessible to experimental manipulation and there is growing evidence that it is partly a self-organized pro process which can occur in the absence of stimuli. And so, and so in this presentation, I would like to give you two hopefully relatively short example of how in my own research, we were able to use a comparative a a a approach to, to understand how tissue morphogenesis works. And this will be, uh, about looking at the 
relative contribution of tissue intrinsic and tissue extrinsic forces during ga 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 gastroation, and then a little bit about the mechanism of epibole. So, so first, maybe I kind of give you the take-home message of, of the first part of the, of the talk. It is, of course, you know, a lot is known about how uh, cells are able to generate forces lo locally. We, for example, have these very well-established mechanisms where epithelial cells would contract asymmetrically on their apical side. And this asymmetric uh, contraction of the tissue level would lead to buckling and in invaginations of those cells inside the embryo during a gastroation process. However, this, is, uh, this process is usually kind of viewed and understood uh, in isolation as a tissue intrinsic, pro tissue intrinsic process, which doesn't interact with the, with the, with the uh, environment. And this is partly because embryos, gastroating embryos typically are actually shielded from the environment. This in, it's at least in insects, gastroation happens inside eggs and they essentially isolated from the external influences. However, what we found and what I will give you evidence for is that there is one part of environment that the, the living embryo can in, interact with and this, this is the inner surface of the shell which, which surrounds it. And it has impact on how morphogenesis actually proceeds and evolves. So, you know, in order to, to, to study this, we, we picked uh, two species which are relatively related to one another, they are both insects. And to, to show that, and which have very divergent uh, ways of, of gastroation. In the first movie which I will play, we see the gastroation of fruit fly Drosophila. I mean, you would have to be living under the rock to not ever see this movie. Schematically, it can be described as a so-called germ band el elongation. And people don't really think about it in that terms very much, but one can think about it as the embryonic part of the blastoderm wrapping around the amniocerosa, which is the extra embryonic part, which will not belong to the embryo. So the embryo wraps around the extra embryo. Now in tribolium, this situation is completely reversed. This is a beetle. The blastoderm of the tribolium is very early specified into anterior cap, which will be extra embryonic and the rest is embryonic. And then the embryonic uh, pr 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 primordium contracts and the extra embryonic cells, they flow all around the embryo. The embryo is invaginating. And these extra embryonic cells, they will surround the embryo entirely and isolate it from the environment like the shell. The shell is around as well. So we can, uh, I, could, I will play with the movie. You can see this, these cells are growing, extending, and they go all the way around and they close down here in a process which is called a serosa window closure. Schematically, it looks like this. This extra embryonic tissue, of course, has a name, like in every good embryology talk, there's a lot of names nobody really knows. So there is, this is the serosa, the embryo is, is contracting, the serosa is flowing, it bends around the posterior edge of the embryo and it closes in the window, encapsulating the embryo, the embryo disappears inside. Okay, so these two processes, they couldn't be more different because they really are opposite. Here the embryo encapsulates the extra embryonic and here is the other way around. Okay, so, um, by the way, this process of intraibolium was very nicely described in a paper in development by Mud Benton and Tassos Pavlopoulos. So now, you know, in Drosophila, the process of castration has been studied ad absurdum. And uh, we know that in, actually in both of those species, it's, uh, this is a very good process to study because it's simple. The anatomy is simple. We have a monolayer of, of epithelial cells which form the blastoderm. This is surrounding the yolk. And this is itself sur sur surrounded by vitellin uh, envelope, another you know, strange word from uh, embryology. You can think about it as the inner su surface of the shell. Even though the shell is a separate thing ar around this, it is the inner surface of the egg covering. And it has this name. I cannot do anything about it. Okay, so now uh, it is known that the tissue intrinsic force generation in the system can be really very well approximated by the activity of myosin, which has to do with the contractivity of the actomyosin cytoskeleton. And this work is 
coming from many people, but I'm mentioning here those two papers, one of them showing that in fact, uh, when you model the behavior of this tissue, it appears to be behaving like a liquid, like a fluid. And then if you know the distribution of con contractility in the cellular system, you can predict more or less how the embryo will fold in a drosophila-like manner. So we went, in, went in, into this project thinking that in tribolium, maybe the, the pattern of myosin contractility across the blastoderm has changed. And that's why the embryo is fo folding in a dramatically di different way. So that's how we approach this. In order to do that, uh, uh, Dijk has been saying that I have been doing mathematical modeling. I have actually not been doing that. I'm collaborating with the best people to do that. I was very lucky to in Dresden be able to collaborate with Stefan Grill. Stefan Grill has made his career looking at biology in a coarse grained manner as an active material. His theory, active uh, polar gel fee, fee, theory, is, is really approximating an biological material from cells to epithelia as a thin film, which behaves like a fluid and which is internally uh, contractile. And this description is remarkably successful at explaining, for example, the polarization of the C. elegans e embryo. And it's been also successful to explain the spreading ep epiboly in, in fish. And it is also a remarkably simple uh, way how to uh, describe it essentially what Stefan says and is a, able to do that if you give him a distribution of contractivity in your system, his theory will be able to predict what kind of flows will happen in that system. And so having that kind of tool, we thought, okay, let's try to visualize the distribution of con contractivity in the tribolium em embryo by uh, taking myosin as a proxy of uh, the tissue intrinsic co 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 contractivity. So we imaged uh, this, you know, one way or, or another, I have to talk about that, we got the myosin into the system and we imaged it in total with light sheet ma microscopy. The movie which you are see seeing here is highlighting the fundamental asymmetry in the system. Myosin is very active and actually increasing in activity in the embryonic part and it's decreasing in activity in the serosa part, which is flowing. Now, unfortunately, Stefan's theory doesn't work in 3D in this beautiful data. So he does what every physicist uh, actually is very good at, reduces the data. And in this case, I would say ad absurdum because we are focusing now on the sagittal cross section of the embryo, which captures all aspects of this process, the flow, the, the changes in the myosin co concentration to make it even simpler, we open the contour of the embryo here and we project it into a line and still it's capturing everything we know, need to know about the system. To further be able to look at it across time, we make a chymograph out of it where every line is one of these pictures just compressed to a line. So this is one dimensional representation of this three terabyte movie, which weighs less than a megabyte, right? It's almost nothing. And that's what physicists really like to work with. So, um, the way to, to, to plot it back onto the embryo is to plot the intensity of the myosin, which is the, which is the color scheme. And the arrows show what the tissue does. This is the flow. And this is the experiment. This is what we observe in the experiment, the dorsal flow of the serosa around the posterior edge. Now, if we apply the Stefan's theory to the system, we get a big surprise because no matter how you do it, the theory will always predict that the ventral side of the blastoderm should also flow towards the accumulation of, of, of myosin. And this is something which we never observe in the experiment. So this is the conflict which we have established here. If you don't believe me, you can watch these movies and you can see that these cells are not moving at all. So the physicists, they have really resolved this beautifully by saying, okay, we can reconcile the experiment and the theory but we have to assume that this tissue must be attached to some external reference flame, frame here in this area. And then our f f theory really predicts the flow properly. And so basically we really went out to, sorry, we went out really to try to corroborate that such attachment, such anchoring to some external reference frame exists. Formally, we could have thought also about the connection to the yolk and 
you know, I actually am thinking ab about this, but but long story short, we focus on whether the embryo is attaching to the vitellin envelope, which, which surrounds it. So we did a lot of experiments. We saw that there are microvilli at the apical side of the cells, that they are extremely active. And we, when we did electron ma microscopy, we were able to see that these microvilli are really touching the vitellin envelope, the inner surface of the vitellin uh, 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 envelope. Then when we did live imaging, specifically in the area where we would predict the attachment, we see that these microvilli are, are retracting and the cells are really attaching to this uh, vitamin, vitamin envelope. And this is happening lo locally in this area. Now to, to look at it in a more glo glo global way, we did this beautiful, I mean, Stefan Minster who did this work, did this beautiful uh, embryological experiment where we inject the tracer into the space between the embryo and the vitamin. It distributes all around. Now we image it from the ventral side and we see that this color tra tracer, which is the, de the dextran, it's excluded from this area where we would predict the attachment. If you don't see it well, well here, when we invert the color, we can see this is the distance map to the vitellin and the distance is very low here in the attachment area. So that convinced us that this attachment actually uh, exists. We did many other experiments, but I will not go into it now. We thought, can we disrupt it, right? So we actually first thought maybe we can disrupt it unspecifically because when we blow up these beautiful EM images, we see that there is maybe a protein complex which, uh, which actually attaches the microvilli to the vitellin. And so we thought we can disrupt it because we can inject into the space between the embryo and the vitellin. We can inject the color mixed with a ridiculous amount of trypsin, right? And what trypsin will do, we'll first of all, eat this protein, right? So we were expecting that then the, or the ventral side of the embryo will feel the pull of the, of the myosin concentration in the posterior and will flow in this direction. And in fact, when we do that, this is exactly what happens. Within minutes, it snaps towards that direction. After that, the embryo dies a horrible death because trypsin is not good for it. So that's actually uh, a caution that this is a really a brute force experiment one should not do. But fortunately, we can do so something better. We can do something genetic because this is not a genetic system, but nevertheless, you know, there is a lot of information about gene expression patterns. And we were looking for genes which were actually expressed in this area and uh, we found a gene which really exactly mimics the area where we would expect the attachment to happen. And we were super happy to find out that this gene encodes for the alpha PS2 uh, integrin, which is a tribolium homologue of famous Drosophila gene, gene, which is called inflated. Now in the system, we can knock out genes very easily, we can do lo loss of function uh, analysis. And so we did that, knocked out this E, integrin and we were expecting then like that we will specifically disrupt the attachment and we would expect this tissue to flow to the posterior. And it does. And sometimes it does so in a spectacular manner that it completely, det it completely detaches from the vitamin envelope and, and actually rotates in, inside the egg. So this made our physicists extremely happy because now they could actually um, say that their theory in this detached embryo, the theory which doesn't even assume the attachment, actually predicts the flow of the blastoderm uh, correctly. So when there is only the intrinsic force, the active polar gel theory actually is able to recapitulate the bi biological process. And they actually did this by fitting the data to this detachmentless uh, situation, which provided really good evidence. So this is a great story, I think, where physics motivated the biology and then the biology provided support for the model, which suggested this phenomenon in the first place. Usually, usually, not always, it is the other way around. Okay, so, but, but now I wanted to say something about evolution, right? So, so we, the physical modeling has allowed us to explain this unidirectional tissue flow and the integrins, you know, provided us with the molecular ha ha handle. So then, you know, how does it look in other insects? For example, Drosophila, where people are looking at this for decades, right? I mean, does that mechanism play any role in, in, in Drosophila? And long story short, it actually does. And this is actually work which has been done in our lab, but also uh, concurrently by Anais Baye from Tomalek Vilab, where she looked at the hindgut e imagination and she showed then in fact, there is an integrin me mediated in interaction of the vitamin of the of the blastoderm with the vitamin uh, with, with the vitamin uh, envelope there. Now, interestingly, this is a, the, the interaction happens at the place where the tissue buckles inward, 
And then when we look back at tribolium, this is not different because here the attachment is in the place where the tissue actually buckles upward to create the head fold. Now, from the point of view of comparative evo divo, it is interesting because these two are these are two different ends of the embryo, the head and tail. These two integrins, these anchors, the two integrins are actually different, different genes, different parallels, different integrins. But what they have in common is that they create a barrier at which tissue buckles. And this barrier happens at the interface between the embryo, which is gray, and the extra embryo, which is pink, right? So that's what kind of leads us to hypothesize that somehow the di divergence, divergent morphogenesis in these two systems could have been driven by changing the pattern of attachment to the inner surface of the vitamin and of the vitamin envelope. And we are trying to do experiments to corroborate it. Now, I want to stress here that in order to discover this process, it was really crucial to look at normal system, to look at tribolium, because there the process is extremely amplified. This attachment persists for hours, whereas in Drosophila, it is completely transient. And it actually was missed for, for many, many years that it even plays a role. So that actually leads me to one, to first first conclusion, saying that the analysis of non-model organism actually has led and can lead to discovery of yet unrecognized realization of morphogenetic processes. Okay, I will not switch entire gear, but I will just continue on the same system and show you one another little story which goes in the same 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 direction. And here we are actually looking at a process which is called epiboly, where in many species during gastrulation, cells are spreading around spherical eggs, right? And this, when this happens in, in, in fish, it is quite known that the embryo has to solve two problems. First one is geometrical. It has to expand over the spheres, meaning it has to expand in, their, in its cell, cell, uh, cell, uh, cell area. But when it reaches the equator and then starts to close on the bottom, it has to contract again, right? So this is a geometrical problem it, it, it actually has to solve. And second, by spreading, it stresses the cells. It induces mechanical stress in this very thin squamous epithelium sheet that this has to be, re it has to be released. And C.P. Heisenberg has, has shown that the mechanism to release the stress is mediated by cell division. But now if we look at tribolium, we have a piboli like like movement we have so far been looking at the first uh, two stages of this process. I hope you see my arrow. But it, this process is continuing, and this these serosa cells are closing down, down here, right? And all this, believe me, happens in the complete absence of cell division. So we wanted to actually understand how does this tissue, how is this tissue able to spread like this, and how it is able to release its internal accumulated stress. In order to look at it, we once again turned to light shield microscopy to be able to look at the embryo really in 3D because this is a process which happens all over the embryo eventually. But in order to be able to look at it, 3D data are not so useful. So we project them to a 2D car cartographic maps and they are quite beautiful. I show you here these movies, which really beautifully highlight these extra embryonic cells which are spreading. The embryo is colored because it's deeper now, it's, it's invaginating and here you see the window. The window is really a window and it closes and it closes entirely, right? So this is great because we can see the dorsal and the ventral side of the embryo in one go. And we can also quantify this much more easily because it's two dimensional image data, it's easy to segment and we can segment the cells and overlay some measurements over it, which relate to the cell shape or, others, or other, other properties. As we are you know, quite interested in the kind of sustainable image analysis, we also developed some software to then bring this data back to 3D so that you can double check that there are no artifacts associated with the projection. And in fact, the data have to be corrected because there is distortion of the lens at the polar sides of the embryo. Okay, so using this, uh, we first kind of observed essentially the geometric problem and the solution to it which is that when we look at the size of the cell, we see that it increases as the development, as the spreading of the serosa cells is increasing. But when at a certain stage, when you compare the, the, the cell area on the dorsal and the ventral side, you notice that the cells which are starting to close down to form the window and to close at the bottom, they actually start, start to increase their area less fast than the dorsal one. So there is a difference. In the, in the rate of uh, area e increase be, between them. 
So they really essentially is a compact. Now, second observation, which is actually quite obvious, but I want to really bring it home here, is that even if the cells compact, you know, there are many of them. When they are at the equator or beyond it, there is as many as 75 cells who are co contributing to the rim of the window. And when the window closes, only about five cells are contributing to the closure. So that means the cells have to go somewhere. So we image this now with confocal microscopy, which gives us much more, much more, uh, much more uh, re resolution. And we notice that the cells, they are exhibiting this specific behavior, which is that they shrink their edge, which is facing the window. They shrink it to nothing, and then they de-intercalate in the plane of the epithelium inside the tissue. They leave the window. So they really reduce from 75 to 5 by this mechanism, which resembles T1 transition, but it's happening at the edge of the tissue. So it's a little bit different. OK, so uh, you know that highlights, when you look at it now glo globally, it highlights the fact that the serosa, even though it doesn't do cell division cells look all the same, it is actually divided into two zones, the dorsal one, where the cells are just homogeneously increasing, and the ventral one, where they are making these cell-to-cell -cell re re rearrangements. And if you just say that, that cells are mixing, you can say that, that this ventral side of the tissue is more fluid than the, than the, than the dor dorsal side of the tissue, which is more, more solid. So this is something which is, let's say, maybe a little bit uh, qualitative. So we turned to a well-established uh, theory, which is able to estimate the rigidity and versus softness of a tissue from static images or from lo just looking at the shapes of the cells. And there is a shape, the shape factor has this, uh, has this magic number 3.81 above, above which the, 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 the cells would be considered to be more fluid-like whereas uh, below it more rigid-like. And in fact, when we measure it on our maps and we compare the dorsal and the ventral side, we see that on the ventral side, the cells have uh, much higher shape factor, which indicates they, that they are behaving like a fluid. We wanted to corroborate this not only by theory, but by also some other independent experiments. And we cannot really do many things in the system, but the experiment, which is very good at evaluating the tension in the tissue is laser ablation. We were somehow expecting that, that there will be some pattern of tension, but naively, I was thinking that the tension is gonna be highest at the rim and lowest on the dorsal side. And we did the experiment, we, lazy, we cut many cells and they recoil and from the recoil velocity, we can estimate tension, the tissue was under. We see that the cells uh, on the ventral sides, they are recoiling sl slower, meaning that there is lower tension. So in fact, the tension light, la landscape is the opposite. And you know, we, provide, we, we, we would like to present this as maybe not, con not completely conclu conclusive, but additional evidence showing that there is a difference, there is a pattern and that perhaps the pattern is about the fluidity of the tissue ventrally versus dorsally. Um, now, what makes the tissue fluidized? Now, we observed that at the rim of the window, there is a strong accumulation of both actin and, and myosin. So there is a formation of something which is in biology known as the actomyosin cable. And uh, I will tell you, give you a couple of information about, about this cable of increasing level of interest, right? Because we did many experiments with it. There is actin and myosin in it. It's a bit hard to see, so we always highlight every 10 frames so that you can see. It changes shape from irregular to triangular to cer circular, and then it disappears. It shrinks in its length to zero. We look at the myosin intensity and we or, or normalize it by the length of the cable, it remains constant, so myosin doesn't increase in it. Yet, the tension in the cable does increase over time. Now, what we found very interesting, and the person who did this experiment is quite brave, is that if you actually cut the K cable at three independent locations, the recoil velocities are comparable, meaning that these cells, they are really contracting as individual units. They are not connected. It's not like there is a tension in the entire cable, and if you cut it once, it, it, it gets released. It's really it's really a unit-like chain of cells which are contracting independently. And the most interesting observation we did, we made was that the myosin in those cells which are contracting at some point becomes very heterogeneous. There's a strong heterogeneity. I will show this to you here. 
and it's kind of expanded into line here and annotated here. And what you, what you will see when you look at this very carefully is that the cells which have more myosin, they are the ones which are shrinking fastest and they are the first ones to leave the rim of the window and de-intercalate into the tissue. So based on that, we propose a model that the kind of probably stochastic hetero heterogeneity of the in the actomyosin cable is basically inducing the sequential deintercalation of the cells from the rim of the window, and that shrinks the cable and reduces the number of cells and, and leads to its uh, and allows let's say its uh, its its closure and at the same time induces re, re, rearrangements in the ventral side and changes the fluidity of of the tissue locally around the closing cable. So that's actually probably for many of you who are very biophysically or, or oriented, it probably has many, many holes. So we try to come somehow test it. In this system, it is quite hard, right? We, we, we are not in the genetic system. We cannot do many things, but one thing we can do, and that is to actually completely abolish the cable, right? We can, we can abolish genetically the border between the extra embryonic and the embryonic tissue, make the, em, make the embryo entirely embryonic. This is another kind of, you know, trips in like hammer experiment. It's not a great experiment to do, but that's the one we did. And so this abolishes the cable. The cable you can see, 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 see here, and in this embryo, the cable is, is gone. And we now look at our, our projections, the initial process of the flow, which we described, I described in the first hour talk, talk happens, and then the window fails to close. So this, we, provide that, we provide that as additional evidence that the, that the cable is, has something to do or is uh, helping the local tissue flu fluidization and the closure of the window. I think what is even more interesting about it is that it is not unique, actually. If you make, in Drosophila, if you make a wound in the epithelium of a, of a disc, in fact, the wound heals by a very similar mechanism. It creates a supracellular actomyosin ca cable that is heterogeneous and, uh, you know, uh, the, the people, several people have shown that this actually causes local tissue fluidization. So I said all the three key, key keywords that we concluded from our tribolium study, but here, this is a physiological process, developmental process, which is crucial for closing the embryo inside the serosa, whereas this is a homeostatic process response to injury. And so this leads me to a second co conclusion here, which is that, um, in fact, this mechanism of local tissue fluidization could be actually a very conserved morphogenetic mechanism that is used both in normal development and in homeostasis to close uh, epithelial gaps. So, so that basically leads me to, to my kind of, you know, uh, finishing salvo for which I maybe don't have as much time as I wa wanted to have, but I will go fast over it, right? So, so you know, I, I use the word morphogenetic module. I think that this is really something which has emerged out of the, over the decades of research in developmental biology, where we view uh, developmental systems as being, uh, Kind of, we, we see that the homogeneous uh, groups of cells are, the, are, are patterned by regulatory molecules such as transcription fa factors which sort out certain cells that then they cannot really do much about changing their, their shape, but they can activate cy cytoskeletal effectors such as ac ac actomyosin to change the shape of these cells lo locally. And when this is coordinated across the tissue, it can lead to really uh, the morphogenesis, the sh shape formation. It is absolutely clear that probably more important than these big arrows are the feedback loops between these levels of regulation. But for the purpose of this argument, we just say this could be represented as the morphogenetic module of, for example, enfolding of the tissue. What you are seeing here on the right side is one example of that, right? It's not it, it's just one instance of it. It's one re realization where in Drosophila, certain transcription factors are specifying mesoderm and they, they induce the apical co constriction which leads to invagination. So this is a mechanism called apical co constriction. So of course, you know, we have found many of such mechanisms by, re, you know, we found, we, found, we, we describe them, we, we understand them on the molecular level, on the cell biology level, even on the biophysical level. But all of this is coming from a handful of model species, which we actually 
like to look at because we have the toolkits. And so what, what I would like to argue in the not, not last five minutes of my talk is that this is a biased picture because when you look at the phylogeny, these uh, species are coming from only a few branches of the phylogeny. And we are really not using the diversity, the enormous di diversity of shape and form a, 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 a creation which is given us to by the phylogeny. What we also are not using is the phylogeny e itself because this is really something which in biology has tremendous predictive power. It is the ground truth of biology. Because of genomes, we can be 100% sure that this phylogeny is correct. I'm part if you think about ctenophora and, and porifera, but whatever, right? It is really the ground truth here, right? And so, you know, I think now it's time to use this because it's used to do in, inference about many things. And I think it's time to use this also to make inference about morphogenetic um, mechanisms. But in order to do that, we have to really abandon this concept of the model species and we have to expand our, our horizons and we have to look at, uh, at, morph at morphogenesis in other species, for example, in the ones which we show here. And I'm by no means saying that people are not, not doing that, but I'm just arg arguing uh, passionately, hopefully, to do more of that, okay? Because what can we learn, learn from this, right? We, we, for example, I love this, this, the, 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 this example, which contrasts animals and the sixth group, the horn of Agilates. Here we have a mechanism where in chronoflagellates, actomyosin con contractivity has been recently shown to, in response to light, change the behavior of the cells and the curvature of the colony so that it changes its behavior from swimming to feeding. In animals, similar mechanisms are used to uh, invaginate tissue during ga ga gastration and the, and the regulation is, is, is completely different. It is driven by transcription factors and signaling pathways. Even we are saying similar mechanism, but these mechanisms here are not so well known and here they are much more known, but they might not even be that similar. It's just that actomyosin is involved. So kind of, even though we are looking here at similar things superficially, it seems that everything has actually changed. The regulation, the, 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 the physiological role and the molecular mechanism. But the one thing it, they, they have in common, it's the, it's the, it's the need to bend the tissue. And that obviously is a physical process. And so this kind of you know, leads me to the obvious re 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 realization that biology in fact fundamentally is expression of physics. And then of course you find out you know, very soon that this is not the new, new idea that in fact people like Wilhelm Hiss and William Rue you know, almost 200 years ago have really thought about it and wrote about it absolutely beautifully and very, very clearly in their kind of school of thought, which is Entwicklung's mechanic, right? But what I think is really key here is that they wrote about it well, right? Because they, without knowledge about molecular biology and everything, they were smart people, right? But, but they couldn't really do much about it because they were missing things. They didn't have the ability to really, you know, look at this system quantitatively and in an unbiased manner, even with machines, which we have now. Thank you, Jan, Jan Husken for this beautiful image. And they also didn't have the fully resolved phylogeny, which allows you to actually make in inference about evolution. And so I think now we have those two things. We have the amazing technology in microscopy and we have the phylogeny. So now I think it's time to try to understand better how, how did evolution exploit physics to create form. Now, I think in order to do that, we need to try to build or finish building essentially, maybe that's a better way to say it, a bridge between two large and established disciplines, evolution of development and tissue mor morphogenesis. Now, stepping onto a little bit thin ice because it's very hard to say these things without offending anyone. Evolution of development, Evo Evo, is really focusing on biological regulation. It is looking at patterns in the bi biological system. It is using uh, sequence alignment to understand the ancestry of se sequences. And it is using, um, you know, the really solid theoretical foundation of population genetics to make inferences about how does the changes in genotype influence the phenotype, right? And these people, and I count myself among them, have made tremendous progress in understanding how information transfer works and evolves in various systems. Of course, it's Evo Devo, Evo. So, you know, these people are absolutely ready to work on non-moral non species. But what I would argue is that for researchers in 
Evo Devo, it is less attractive to look at the mechanism because mechanism, how the genotype creates the phenotype is often represented as a, as a black box. But we don't have to despair because there is the other field. There is the, there is the tissue morphogenesis, which is really interested in how the effectors collectively lead to collective cell behavior and emergence of, of, of the form. They really come to the, come to the rescue. Those are researchers which are using the latest, greatest technology in microscopy, in physical ma ma manipulation. And it is very, this is a field which is very heavily relying on another strong theoretical foundation, which is the physics theory. Now, now this is a field which is all about mechanisms. And it is the field which has done, I think in biology, the farthest foray into physics, into understanding uh, biological systems from the physics point of view. But once again, I need to say something negative. I would, I would argue that researchers in that field, I mean, even though they are interested, it is hard for them to really look at the connection between the regulation and the, and, and, and the effectors. And because they are using these really complex, you know, state-of-the-art technologies, they tend to stick with the small organism where the toolkits exist. And so they really suffer, and this I know, from a severe model organism bias. So I think now really it's actually time to combine the, the, the experimental, the, the conceptual and the theoretical approaches of morphogenesis and evo devo and, that, and, and study this as a, you know, as a one process, as, in, as a one essentially, let's say field or, or a question. So I think that this will allow us really to discover, if we start looking at the phylogeny to discover really many new realizations of the morphogenetic modules, we will be able to more systematically connect these biophysical mechanisms to gene regulation. And hopefully like that, we will be able uh, to better understand how biology utilizes physics to evolve uh, new forms. Um, you know, I think that it would be really good to, to actually do this, right? I mean, one would really focus not starting from the regulation, which is typically how you enter these kind of processes, focus more on the cells and their, 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 their behavior. Use embryological manipulation, multimodal imaging, physical modeling. Oh, sorry, oh, this is bad time to, to click the wrong button. Um, invest a lot in technologies which will allow us to really probe the effectors, probe the protein activities, measure the forces and tissue pro tissue properties and, and manipulate the system biophysically with magnets, light, electricity, what, what not. We would also, of course, not forget about the regulators, but we should not focus only on the level of gene expression because this arrow is all about regulation on the protein level. And so we should really think about developing technologies which allow us to do the kind of analysis we do on the RNA level, the single cell RNA analysis also on the protein level. And so that's a really big, big challenge. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the technology is all there to, for example, combine the dynamics and the dynamics and uh, ultra structure to look at the dynamic process. And when it does something very interesting during embryogenesis to stop it and look at the ultra structure with techniques like electron mi microscopic. And so, you know, one can do light sheet imaging and bring the embryo through gastroation to certain points and then stop it and do whole embryo EM, do gene expression patterns, do single cell omics and really collect data on a massive scale, but not for one organism. This is maybe the point here more, but to do it really systematically systematically across the tree, tree of life. The second thing is that we really need to, you know, use the theory. I mean, I think argue, I argued about this, I showed you how we use it, but I think the theory, we need a new type of theory. We need a theory which not only looks at physics at this foundation of tissue morphogenesis, but which also looks as, at the evolutionary theory. And I honestly say, say that I have no idea how how, how to do it, but I'm quite sure that people are doing it, are trying to do it, and we just need to bring these people to that. I think that now is really the time to do it because we now have this phylogeny which I've been you know, rumbling about, but this is really a point which I would like to get, get across because like 20 years ago, the phylogeny looked like this. We really didn't know anything. We knew something about the origin of multicellularity and the first few, few branches but we didn't know what's happening here. And we were looking at only four species. Now we have technologies to look at every species and we have the fully resolved uh, phylogeny, 
So we can infer what is happening at these crucial nodes across the phylogeny, and we can really understand how morphogenesis evolves. So, you know, I think that really take home message here is that I really think we should, I would like to build the bridge between those two, two fields. And I would like to convince the Evo Devo people that they can use the advanced techniques. They can open the bla black box. They can really look at the mechanism that, that it's not really, really difficult. And, you know, open access uh, movement is making all these technologies much more accessible than they were. So that people who are actually in the paleontology department or zoology department or anatomy department, they can start thinking about doing biophysics. And I would like to also open the eyes of the tissue morphogenesis people to, to actually really, you know, look at these beautiful animals and what they can do because many of the processes which they study and compete on in one model organisms, they are actually amplified. They are much easier and much more accessible in the other species. And if they, you know, communicate with the Evo Devo community, you can, they can totally get to it. And I will say at the end, you know, how it worked for me, but this is it, right? So I'm still looking for a place to do this, you know, Second to last slide, maybe I even have found one. So I have recently sta started a kind of second small sub chapter in my life where I became a director of the SATEC, which is a, which is an institute in Czech Republic in Brno. That's where I studied and where, where, I, where my heart is still, Central European Institute of Technology. Why is it a place to do this? Because of Gregor Mendel who did his experiments with peace there? No, it actually is because you might not know it. But 35% of the electron microscopes in the world, they are produced there. There's a lot of R&D in there. And we are not talking about the old fashioned uh, TEM electron microscope. We are talking about the cryo-EM microscope, state of the art, what everybody buys. It's made in Brno. So, you know, watch us. We will want to, we want to kind of exploit it more and, and bring, you know, this kind of uh, large scale science using co uh, a correlative light and electron microscopy to Brno. I'm contractually more or less obliged to promote Brno. So sorry about that. Thank you. I would like to stop here by thanking um, these two people, C.P. Heisenberg and Andreas Heinol, with whom we have kind of formulated the, these, uh, the, these ideas. And I would like to thank Janelia, who kind of facilitated us getting together to try to pro propose it as the new research direction. They decided at the end to go so somewhere else, but we had the fantastic think tank and you know, brought people together and really these ideas were kind of formulated there. So, so, so thank you for, for that. And the second acknowledgement goes to my lab, which is down here. I talked about the work of Stefan Minster and Akancha Jane. Stefan did the attachment story and Akancha did the epiboli story. I mean, this was all very much facilitated by Tassos Pavlopoulos who br brought the beetle system to my lab and the Tribolium research uh, uh, community, which was fantastic at helping me from a Drosophila researcher become, you know, actually relatively able in my lab, not me, but my people work on Tribolium. This works and I encourage people to do it. It is enormous fun. Theory powered by Grill and uh, experiments powered by MPI CBG facilities. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Uh, I will, uh, if you can go ahead and stop screen sharing. Maybe. Yes, totally. Uh, we already have several questions, but I'll take the um, chair's privilege and ask the first question. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by the notion of uh, evolutionary developmental biology as you're framing it, uh, kind of in, including these physical mechanisms, and also evolutionary cell biology. But it seems like both of those have a, uh, a an issue or a um, complexity, and that is. In, in, especially in the cases that you're talking about with tissue morphogenesis, where things are going to be very sensitive to boundary conditions, mm -hmm. um, a change in the boundary conditions under which these these modules are operating can cause a big change in the what how the system evolves downstream, or, or I mean, evolves in time downstream, not evolutionarily, but how the how the tissue changes through time. So you have this kind of nonlinear relationship between boundary conditions and these. Uh, morphogenetic movements, uh, it seems like it's, uh, that poses a challenge to, to use uh, these morphogenetic movements and relate them to phylogeny. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Uh, the fact that there's not a, um, they're, they're yeah, yeah, smooth yeah. transitions, they're relatively sharp jumps, right. yeah. or relatively small changes. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, you know, this is really probably it's a great question, right? And I don't I don't think I have an answer, right? But what comes to my mind when I when I hear you speak about it, and we should probably discuss it more, and is that is that uh, you know one one can definitely learn from removing the constraints, and that's what's actually happening now in uh, mammalian uh, developmental biology quite a lot, just you know, or vertebrate, removing the the constraints and seeing you know that that the cells you know, when they are taken out of the natural environment, they are starting to exhibiting uh, behaviors they maybe have not exhibited uh, uh, before, right? And, you know, sometimes one could even argue that they are revealing something about the, about, about the ancestry. So, so maybe one could say, you know, if your, our comparative approach is also including removing the boundaries, yeah. right? I actually even got the ERC grant on, mm -hmm studying specifically this attachment, right? And so, you know, one of the experiments which we did was to just go across the phylogeny and remove the shells, right? And see, you know, which embryos are fine with that. And there are many which just don't care, right? I mean, as long yeah. as you take care of them. And then others which we really need it, right? So, so maybe that's one, one answer. The other one is, I think it is really beautiful is, is you know, maybe we can really need to start to rethink, you know, how evolution happens and what actually evolves because we are constantly thinking that it is the, it is the genome and only genome which is evolving. What I would argue is that what evolves also is the behavior of the cells. The cells have agency. They have ability given by the genome to do different behaviors. And they are awakened, you know, depending on the context, right? And so it's very hard to imagine, you know, as you are saying, there are big jumps, right? The context changes, you know, this doesn't come from mutation accumulation. This is just something which just happened, right? I mean, we don't know really how, right? But the cells are reacting to it. They're able to react to something they have never seen before. I mean, I, for example, love Hydra because Hydra, you know, the, there is nowhere in the, in, the, in the wild that somebody would take Hydra, dissociate it into single cell, then spin it and make a new Hydra out, out of it. Yet they can do it without a problem. I have a physicist in the lab who can do it herself, you know, easy, right? So, you know, very wishy-washy answer, but that's my answer. No, no, that's a great answer. I'll, in the interest of getting to the audience questions, I'll, I'll uh, move on. Um, to get at least a couple of the audience questions. Uh, so uh, Roberto Alonso Matia asks, uh, how does the hydrodynamic length scale compare with the size of the embryo? Yeah, and then, yeah. And then a second question, I'll just go ahead and add the, ask them together. In your actomyosin cable results, myosin intensity per unit length remains constant, but tension increases over time. And can you comment on this counterintuitive result? Yeah. Okay, so the, the first one about the hydrodynamic length, this is essentially, you know, as I understand it, you know, how far the, the tissue feels to the pool of the myosin. And so we, we had a really hard time as, as estimating it in our system. But, you know, from what, uh, from what we have done, you know, it looks like that it's probably even longer than the embryo. So it should be kind of felt throughout the embryo, um, um, which is based on analogy with C. elegans where Stefan did it really well. Uh, quantitatively. Uh, the, the other question was about the uh, increase in um, uh, tension. Uh, I, I forgot what was the rest of the question. Well, that was the, uh, in the actomyosin cable results, the myosin intensity per unit length remained constant. Yeah, yeah. Tension increased over time. Yeah. Uh, and is that consistent? Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, what I was thinking about it the moment when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> which is very funny. So, so that's actually great, right? Thank, thank you for, for actually spotting it. That doesn't maybe seem to make that much sense. Um, so maybe, maybe I would say that maybe it has to do with the heterogeneity because the heterogeneity doesn't really become up, becomes apparent only later, right? And so then basically the, the, it depends really where, which cells you cut. And uh, if you cut the cell which has more, more myosin, it will, it, will, it will be different than the one which has less 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 myosin so maybe that that kind of might explain it at least partially but yeah great. maybe not completely satisfactorily enough <laughs> great well i think we're over our allotted time uh so i there are um three more questions david jean ricky garner and lady valan and i uh will leave these questions in the queue open in the q a and mm -hmm. uh maybe pavel can uh type answers uh, but also I encourage you to show up to the discussion zone uh, afterwards. So um, now uh, do we,